Welcome to the August 2020 edition of City Connection. City Connection is the live television program with Grand Rapids Mayor Roslyn Bliss offering the community opportunity to hear about efforts from City Hall and beyond. And during City Connection, we also reach out to you, provide time with the mayor for your questions and comments. We'll do that a little bit later in the program. With Community Media Center, I'm your host, Linda Galash. It's good to be back with you in this time of pandemic. We've not put on one of these shows in several months, one of these live shows with Mayor Bliss. So happy to be back. Today we do this in a hybrid broadcast method, live in both ways. Uh, live with the mayor here in the GRTV Community Media Center studio. I am live with mayor and we have with us our guest who is by video joining us live. We will have on the show later today, Brandon Davis. He is directing what is a somewhat new created, newly created office. It's the Office of Oversight and Accountability. We'll be talking with Brandon Davis about his new role in serving as a liaison between the community and city on issues related to public safety. Davis is charged with promoting trust, accountability, and transparency in the public safety realm. And uh, now in a time of calling for redirecting funds for the police. So we'll have a lot to talk about with the mayor shortly and Brandon Davis. We'll do that in the second half of the hour. You can have your questions be a part of the program. Do that by emailing cityconnection at grcmc.org. You can also do that with Twitter. It's at GRTV Access and on GRTV's Facebook page. City Connection is a collaboration with Community Media Center and the City of Grand Rapids. We're broadcasting live today, August 3rd, here on the Community Media Center's Channel 24, live streaming at therepidian.org, again on Facebook at GRTV's uh, Facebook page. Um, enough of those intros, Mayor, but great to be back with you yeah. because uh, we've not been able to do this for a few months in times of pandemic. There's much for us to catch up on, <laughs> and I would love to give you up to just to kind of lead it with some of the bigger things to yeah. talk about right now in this uh, time of at least partial shutdowns in our world. Yeah, thanks. I know it has been a long time, so it's good yeah. to be back. I feel like this year has been such a whirlwind uh, for everyone. You know, I was I had a couple of meetings this morning, and you know, like like everyone during this time, it's just challenging. You know, there's mm -hmm. a lot going on. There's a lot of uncertainty. Obviously, we're still living with that pandemic and we're working hard to continue to mitigate the spread of COVID while also supporting our local economy. So a lot with through the shutdown, a lot of businesses have really struggled over the last several months. And so we wanna support our local businesses while we also stay safe, but also try to get back to doing some activity and reconnecting with people, knowing that a lot of people have been isolated and that alone brings on a whole host of issues that people are struggling with. So um, at City Hall, you know, thinking back, it seems like a lifetime ago, um, you know, to mid-March with the emergency declaration and the immediate shutdown, uh, we went into emergency operating mode, uh, largely in partnership with the county. So this period of time, a lot of people have been confused about the different levels of government. Uh, people have called uh, on the city asking a lot of questions about public health, but. We've been reminding folks that our, our counties in our state lead public health. So we've been working really closely with Dr. Adam London and the county over the last several months. Uh, and then a ton of our community partners from United Way to nonprofits to work with them to provide support and relief to families, um, to all of our economic development partners, looking at what can we do in the short term to support our businesses, to hopefully survive this pandemic. Uh, and then working really closely with the state and the county and our partnership, our partners, figuring out how do we come out of this safely and start to reopen safely. And that's really where we are right now is how do we continue to have um, safety precautions in place, encourage people to continue to abide by all those safety precautions that we know help prevent the spread of COVID while we also try to get back to some sense of, of a local economy that's open. So it's been an interesting journey and we're not out of the woods yet. You know, I continue to remind people um, we're still living with COVID. The, you know, wearing a mask works. I know this has unfortunately become a political issue when it's really not. You know, the medical experts have been very clear that wearing a mask helps prevent the spread of COVID. So that and hand washing and sanitizing, uh, you know, all of your doorknobs and everything else as often as possible. Um, and then keeping a physical distance from folks. 
Speaking of which, uh, I don't know if this is, comes through on camera, but you and I are at least six feet apart at this moment. We entered the building and the room uh, with masks and adhering to what is um, the best advice out there at this point. Yeah, yeah. It is a delicate dance between um, trying to preserve our, our business climate, cli uh, our small businesses, and keep people healthy. And um, imagine you as mayor of the second largest city in the state communicate pretty regularly with our governor. What are those communications like right now? Yeah, so I serve on a, um, a number of statewide uh, committees looking at safety uh, as well as how do we make sure that we're communicating that clearly. Um, I've been in regular communication with a statewide group that's been put together to look at economic recovery. Uh, and then I uh, probably about four months ago, end of March, created a local uh, Grand Rapids Economic Recovery Task Force. And we're looking at three areas. How do we support our businesses? Uh, how do we create public spaces that are safe? And how do we really rethink how to use outside space, knowing that space is critical to preventing the spread of COVID, and then workforce development. So I'm very, very concerned at the number of individuals who have lost their jobs, uh, and some of those jobs are not coming back. So I get notifications from companies who lay off employees or they eliminate positions altogether, and we know that we're just starting to see an uptick in um, companies who have said, okay, the PPP is not enough. I'm not going to be able to maintain at the level I was at, and I'm cutting positions. Uh, and then also a lot of individuals were furloughed, and we know that that furlough status is starting to end. And some of those individuals who are furloughed are being told that uh, their jobs are being eliminated. So they're going into either, um, they either lost their jobs or they're being laid off more indefinitely. Uh, so I'm extremely concerned about individuals who are being impacted by a loss of job. And then how do we make sure that as we think about the future of work, what does that look like and how we can support people as quickly as possible around workforce development, skill building. Uh, so those are our three big buckets that we're really focused on right now as we look at um, our local economy. On the business side, we've worked extremely closely with a lot of our small businesses, both through Local First, uh, The Right Place, uh, Hispanic Chamber, the Grand Rapids Chamber, looking at what we can do to support both customers and um, employers to build in all of those safety practices. Uh, and, you know, fortunately in our community, we've had a pretty high compliance rate. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had restaurants and bar owners come together uh, really on their own to say, we're going to make a promise and we're going to ask other businesses to sign on to this Michigan promise, Michigan restaurant promise. Uh, really, as a business owner, I'm promising to create the most safe space as possible for you, but I also am asking you to comply with our rules. So we've been working very closely with a number of folks, and then you've probably seen the city has worked closely with um, the Downtown Development Authority and our corridor improvement districts to take streets and sidewalks and turn them into spaces where businesses can use them, both retailers and some bars and so you've seen those pop up throughout the city and we're hopeful that that also creates some spaces where people can you know get back to at least serving a a fraction of their customer base you know with the change of seasons that will be coming some of that won't be quite as possible and we're um, kind of teetering on a, a little bit of a recoil from some of the opening type things what do you see as a next stage as weather does change yeah. come fall well, we've been talking a lot about that, and uh, you know, I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna challenge folks to embrace all four seasons, and uh, you know, to to still get outside. So I know with our business districts, we're looking at can we add in heaters, can we add in spaces that block the wind and rain, but still have them be outside and have good air, air circulation. Uh, we're looking at large spaces that we can take over and have pop-up retail. So um, at the Convention Arena Authority, we're looking at turning the ballroom into kind of like a pop-up shop where small businesses will be able to rotate through. So if you think of like the wine and beer festival and how you have different um, spaces set up, we're thinking about how can we do that? We're talking to the Van Andel Arena. So we're even looking at inside spaces that are large enough that we can maybe uh, utilize those to support our, our small businesses as well. Through the holidays, have some type of holiday market. Um, and then this winter, similar to what we saw in January with the uh, you know, prismatic downtown and all the events we did downtown, we're gonna encourage people to keep on their winter coat and their hats and their boots mm -hmm. and 
hang out outside and we'll have some warming stations set up. We're really trying to think about how do we keep this space available all year long. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully we'll come, uh, I'm confident we're gonna come out of COVID. I'm confident that we're gonna hopefully have a vaccine at some point. Uh, and then we need to think about what did we do during COVID that we hope sticks around? You know, the, um, do we wanna keep these larger outside spaces available? Uh, and you know, what does that look like? I think there's a lot we're gonna learn from COVID that will say, this is just good for community and we should do a whole lot more of it. I just don't think we're there yet. We're still in reaction and preparing mode. Uh, we haven't really had a chance to take a deep breath and say, okay, what did we learn and what do we wanna keep and how can we do things better in the future? In a similar vein, I saw, I believe it was a resolution from you that supported independent um, uh, small venues or venues yes. too. So kind of some of those efforts and um, you're talking about repurposing venues and spaces like that to yeah. help us get through this stretch. Um, not there yet, but I do look forward to the conversation when we kind of do look at the takeaways that are things we want to keep a part of our culture, part of the way we operate as humans. So that ought to be a very interesting next step yeah. or future step. Yeah. All right. Well, we've got um, a lot to say on that subject, but one to jump through a few other things that we can um, discuss before we get to uh, Mr. Davis. A um, few things. One is um, election day is coming up tomorrow. It is the yes. primary elections tomorrow and just the basics in terms of polling times and uh, how you deal with a ballot that has a, a division down the middle and that sort of thing. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because it's a big day tomorrow, election day, it's a primary election. And so what that means is you, you have to decide whether you wanna vote in the Democratic primary or Republican primary. So when you get your ballot, there's a line down the middle and you can only vote on one side of the ballot. Uh, and I encourage you to, if you haven't done it yet, you, and you have your absentee, uh, to fill it out and then to drop it off at City Hall. So we have a drop box on the outside um, off of Ottawa. You can drop your ballot in there. You can even take it to the clerk's office on the second floor and drop it off. Uh, but make, if you cross over uh, and vote in both the Republican and the Democratic primary, then your, your ballot will be spoiled. Um, so just be mindful of that. But there's some important competitive primaries on the ballot tomorrow, and I encourage folks to vote. Polling places open at 7 a.m. They'll be open till 8 p.m. Uh, and so you can you know, get there early and, and vote. We have a lot of safety precautions in place to make sure that people feel safe. Uh, with that being said, a lot of folks have already, have already voted absentee, which is a good thing. Uh, and so similar to other elections, we sent out notification since the law changed that you can uh, no reason absentee. And since that time, we've seen a real uptick in the number of folks who have voted by absentee ballot. One concern has been that a lot of requests for the absentee ballots, although not as many turned in yet. So your mention yes. of you can take those absentee ballots filled out to City Hall and drop those off yep. at the clerk's office or outside at a box available there. Yes. All right. Well, we're gonna, um, I wanna mention one more thing before we take a <laughs> break and welcome back uh, with uh, Mr. Davis. But first one is saw a little bit of information on recognition of our legal affairs department. Uh, our city attorney, Anita Hitchcock, along with legal affairs, um, director of legal affairs, Elizabeth Joy Fossil, both yeah. recognized by the State Bar Association. Yeah. And uh, a, a, good, um, a good note for our city. It is, you know, it's so, it, I, we, we're so blessed at the city to have exceptional staff. Uh, and I congratulate both of them for their recognition. You know, ev even our appointed officials, you know, our city treasurer has been recognized. Our city manager is known throughout the country and is uh, head and shoulders, one of the top city managers in the country. Uh, and so we're very fortunate in this community to have great leadership at City Hall within our organization. And you'll get to meet one of them momentarily with Mr. Brandon Davis. Yes. Well, we will take a break now. And speaking of the city manager, this was one, a new position, a new appointment that came up. Brandon Davis will join us after this break. He is uh, leading the Office of Oversight and Accountability. We'll be back with City Connection after this break.
Hi, I'm happy to be back uh, to talk with our new Director of Public Oversight and Accountability, Mr. Brandon Davis. So a little bit of history, uh, it was about a year and a half ago that one of the recommendations from the community was to create an Office of Public Oversight and Accountability. And it was last year, so probably about a year, just over a year ago, uh, the City Commission we supported in the budget um, funding for this position and then our city manager started the process to create the Department of Public Oversight and Accountability and with that he uh, appointed an interim director and that was Mr. Brandon Davis and then went through a national search. Mr. Davis applied for that position and after a pretty lengthy uh, interview process with community input, Mr. Davis was selected as the permanent director of the Office of Public Oversight and Accountability. So I'm glad to have him with me today uh, so that you can learn more, not just about him and his past and experience and what he brings to the city, but also um, some of his hopes uh, in the days ahead with the office. It's a newly created office, uh, and so I think he's been the permanent director for maybe uh, eight weeks maybe. I'll let him give a little timeline since my uh, time lately has been a little bit of a time warps. Uh, but also I think it's more important now than ever as our community comes together to talk about police reform uh, that we elevate this office. So just uh, about three weeks ago the City Commission we shifted funding from our police department about four hundred thousand um, dollars from our police department for some additional support both for Brandon's office as well as a chief of staff position that will fall under the police department under Chief Payne who will also work with Mr. Davis. So we'll get it a little, we'll go into that detail a little bit more. Um, but with that, I'd like to introduce Mr. Davis and maybe, maybe uh, Brandon, you can start with just sharing uh, a little bit about your role at the city, um, the office and some of your experience, which makes you a really great fit for this position. Sure. Well, good afternoon and thank you for having me. I am excited to have this platform to talk about the Office of Oversight and Public Accountability. As the mayor indicated, we were uh, founded or the office was created in August of last year. Um, and it was the result of uh, input from community and, and great listening on the part of our city manager and our elected leaders that brought this office into fruition. Um, our responsibility is to build bridges to trust between public safety and community. And we do that by increasing accountability and transparency. And that's a major lift. Uh, when we really talk about it, we have to always be honest about the place we find ourselves in, in Grand Rapids and across the country. And that, that honesty says that there has been breakdowns between public safety departments, not just in Grand Rapids, but, but nationally uh, and many community members. So in order for us to get to a place of trust, we have to first look at transparency and we have to look at increasing accountability. And that is the role of the Office of Oversight and Public Accountability. We'll do that in many ways. Uh, and, and the mayor knows I could talk about this for mm -hmm. a long time. So I, I won't do that, but we'll do that in, in many ways. Some of those ways include looking at uh, looking at trends, meaning things that have been happening through statistical data and analysis uh, and say, is this the right thing that's happening? We're looking at embedding equity into all public safety operations. And, and that means that we follow what's already been set out in the city strategic plan. And, and we go in and we disaggregate data and we look and say, are there disparate outcomes based off of the way we do things? We ask questions uh, and that question includes, you know, are we doing this the right way? Not just have we been doing this for a long time, because a lot of times that's true. We've been doing public safety really well, according to what the standards of public safety are right for a long time but as we sit in these seats and begin to reimagine what policing looks like in grand rapids that's a new question and the new question is are we doing this the right way uh, and and then if we are not what should we do to make those changes so i'm excited to be able to serve in, the, in this role because i believe that it brings together all of my professional experiences so uh, I'm an attorney. Uh, I worked as both a defense attorney and prosecutor for, for long periods of time. When I worked as a prosecutor, I started off in Wayne County's prosecutor's office, the last in Detroit. And then I went on and, and worked in uh, Muskegon County's prosecutor's office as a senior assistant prosecutor. And, and during that time, I, 
I tried serious felony cases um, and, and was involved in an investigation of those cases. Uh, and then I worked in the labor relations department of the city. So when you merge those two worlds, it's really the employee relations and the criminal uh, justice world together. This position is perfectly suited for my skill and background. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. Uh, and you know, in our community, and, and Linda knows this as well, uh, you know, we have been talking about and working on improving community and police relations for years now. And uh, really in partnership with a lot of folks in the community and organizations. Yes. Uh, this, this work has always been important, uh, but it is definitely more urgent now in the wake of the tragic killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so many other people that have really brought to the forefront this urgency for police reform, policing different, but also more importantly, and what I try to keep my eye on is how do we eliminate racialized outcomes in policing and not just policing, uh, but in systems across our community. And so as we've had those ongoing conversations since May 31st, uh, Brandon, Mr. Davis has been really critical in those community conversations and working closely with Chief Payne, uh, looking at what the department needs to do internally to create change, meaningful, long-lasting change. Uh, and then also, how is the Office of Oversight and Accountability going to work with community? And so, uh, Mr. Davis has been working on a strategic plan for his office for the last um, several months, and that you just released that probably about 10 days ago, and it is now available online, and we're seeking input and feedback, and you can do that electronically. So, Brandon, do you want to talk a little bit about those pillars that are within your strategic plan, and then how people can weigh in, review those, um, those pillars, but also provide feedback? Definitely, Mayor. Thank you. So, uh, online now on, on OPA's website, um, which is a part of the city's page, if you go to the city website and just put in oversight and public accountability, it will take you to our web page. Uh, there are what we're calling our draft priorities, uh, which are lift, listed um, for community input. So, the pillars of the Office of Oversight and Public Accountability are built around uh, the acronym CARE Plus, which is change, accountability, restorative justice, empowerment and engagement, and then the plus, right? So when we talk about change, we're really talking about OPA helping to improve public safety operations through innovation and collaboration. And that's where we think about looking at policy. And as we look at that policy, we're looking uh, with the knife for equity and we're saying, are we embedding equity into all public safety operations? We're looking at, uh, are there racialized outcomes? Uh, a lot of times there can be well-intentioned policies that have the outcome of causing harm to one community over another. Um, and, and the truth is, a lot of times when these policies were created, that was not the lens that was being used at the time. So the city is being very intentional about looking at our, our policies, looking at our practices, not just in our public safety departments, but for the purposes of this discussion in our public safety departments to say, are we doing this the right way? Uh, are there outcomes that are disparate? And if so, what can we do to make changes in those areas? So when we think about that change aspect, really it's a commitment uh, on, on the part of OPA to say, there are things that need to be changed and we'll do within what's in our power to help make that change happen. Yeah. When we talk about accountability, which is the A in care, we really think about like traditional um, traditional mechanisms like internal affairs or our civilian appeals board process. So I don't know how much everyone knows about those processes, so I'll give a, a, a quick overview of it. When we talk about our internal affairs processes, uh, that is the process in which complaints are reviewed as it relates to our police officers. And there's also a process uh, like that or, 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 or somewhat like that in our fire department. But what happens is if a, a citizen has a complaint about the actions of a police officer or command officer, they can then file that complaint. And that complaint is reviewed internally by the police department and they make a determination related to that complaint, either to sustain or uh, those findings, which means that they agree with the complaint that was given by the citizen, or they can find otherwise and, and disagree essentially with the uh, complaint that was filed by the citizen. After that point, the police chief then has the authority to issue discipline as it relates to that complaint. So that's the traditional internal affairs process. 
Grand Rapids was already ahead of the times as it relates to this next part, which is our Civilian Appeals Board. Our Civilian Appeals Board allows uh, citizens on certain types of cases to appeal the decision of the Internal Affairs Division if they disagree with it to a group of citizens who are appointed to review uh, those files. And the citizen uh, in that group, the CAP, as we call them, can review that those findings. And if they find that the Internal Affairs Department did not uh, find uh, accurate, they were not accurate, or they or they made a decision that was not uh, comporting with the, the facts in the case, they can change those facts altogether, uh, which is uh, an exceptional uh, civilian appeals. We have an exceptional uh, civilian appeals board in Grand Rapids, and you know, in, in my time in this role, I've been reviewing lots of citizen boards, and not all boards have the authority to change findings. So the fact that Grand Rapids has that level of authority in our civilian appeals board is a big deal, and it's something that we should be proud of about the level of accountability in our system. Um, so after that point, the the uh, city manager then has the authority to change discipline based off of a change in the civilian appeals board process. So when we talk about accountability, we're talking about that system. And, and, and my role and what OPA will be doing is reviewing that system and making recommendations for changes to that system in order to really fit the needs of Grand Rapidians, one, and also increase our accountability and elevate resident voice in those processes. So one of the things we know we're doing is that OPA will now serve um, as a place where citizens can file complaints. So we'll be able to receive those complaints online via phone or email or any of those types of things because we recognize because there is a breakdown in trust, it may be difficult for some citizens to go to the police to complain about police or the same thing with the fire department. So we serve as a liaison, right? In between those, that department and community to begin to build out that process. And our strategic plan details some of those things, but uh, we're, we're building out a process in which that can be done and be done well in a way that is independent and fair. Yeah. The next part is restorative justice. Uh, and that restorative justice part, it really makes our office unique. So when we talk restorative justice, we're saying that we recognize there have been disparities in the criminal justice system, and we're going to do our part as a city to make changes to that, to eliminate those disparities. And we'll do that through several ways. But a, a lot of things we're looking at include uh, decriminalization of certain types of crimes, right? So we're looking to say, should this be a crime? Should this be a violation? And if it shouldn't be, what should we do about it? Or if it needs to be, what can we do to make sure there are uh, equitable outcomes as it relates to these types of crimes? Uh, and for the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip past that one and go directly to empowerment and engagement. And really that that one talks about making sure that we are making sure that that community understands the laws and policies that they're being uh, held responsible to. Uh, and, and we could talk about that all day, but I won't do that. All right. Thank you, Brandon. So we're going to take a break here, break here briefly, and then we'll be back with you for additional questions. But um, the other thing that, that Mr. Davis is doing is working really closely with our equity office, and that is um, led by Ms. Stacy Stout, and they're putting together a whole host of community initiatives and events. And one of them coming up is on August 12th. I'm yes. really talking about um, trauma and the impact of, uh, of racism on people's lives, but also how um, we know that there's a lot of trauma in our community that we also have to have to really grapple with and heal from um, as we move forward together. So I'll let Mr. Davis talk more about some of the things coming up out of his office and our equity office. And we'll also remind you how you can find more information on the four pillars um, under care. And you can weigh in and give your input on those because it's really important that the community has an opportunity to weigh in as we move forward together. Um, so with that, we'll take a little break and then we'll come back for additional questions with Mr. Davis. GRPL2Go is a safe and easy way to get physical books, movies, and music from your library. To get started, browse the online library catalog and place holds on the items that interest you. 
You can have up to 25 holds at one time. When the items you placed on hold are available and ready for pickup, the library will notify you by text, email, or phone. Drive, bike, or walk to the GRPL location you selected to pick up your holds. If you are driving, park your vehicle in a GRPL to go spot and call or text the number on the sign. Please give your full name and a description of your vehicle. A staff member will bring out your library material to you. If you are walking or biking, there is a walk-up kiosk where you can pick up your items. Our staff are using personal protection equipment like face masks as well as social distancing to ensure that grpl to go is safe for both patrons and staff. When you are done with your items, please return them to any outside GRPL book drop. All return material will be heat treated and quarantined for 72 hours. GRPL has eliminated late fees on overdue material, so no worries if you need an extra day or two to finish that book. To learn more about GRPL to go and our reopening plan, visit grpl.org forward slash reopen. And welcome back to City Connection. We're visiting with uh, new director of the Office of Oversight and Accountability, Brandon Davis, just visiting with the mayor. And we're now into a Q&A section. So I want to pitch this question that came to us through Facebook. Uh, the question comes from Nikki. And mayor, it's for you as well as you, uh, Mr. Davis. And it says, uh, are there models that we're looking to from other cities that have established trust between community and police? What lessons can we learn and what not to do? Yeah, well, that's a great question. There are some best practice models out there. Uh, you know, the caveat I always use is that just because something works in another community doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work here. Uh, every community ha is unique and they have their own assets and resources. Uh, sometimes people will compare us to much smaller communities uh, that are less urban, so meaning less dense. You know, we are a city of 200,000 and 44 square miles. Uh, so we have to take those, even those demographics into consideration. Uh, but with that being said, there are some really good best practices out there. Uh, and we are looking at those. And I know uh, Mr. Davis has been researching those for OPA and has done some extensive research on that. I'll give you one example. Uh, and that is that, you know, we're looking right now to add um, behavioral health and mental health specialists to our homeless outreach team. So about three months ago, we created a homeless outreach team composed of individuals from our fire department and police department to go out and connect with, build relationships, and help people who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, and our team has done some really exceptional work, uh, but we know that there are some, some deep issues uh, that our police officers and firefighters aren't necessarily uh, trained for to help individuals who may be experiencing PTSD or substance use or a mental health crisis. So we're looking at adding some clinicians to that team, and that is a best practice model. Um, a number of other cities have already implemented that, and it can be called a number of different things, a crisis response team, a mental health response team, uh, but we're very hopeful that in the next uh, 30 days that we'll be able to, to add that to our homeless outreach team and then learn from that. Again, I can't ever promise that we're not going to um, learn and say this worked and this didn't, uh, but I do promise that we will pivot as we learn. Uh, but my hope is that it's successful and then we can expand that beyond just responding to individuals who are homeless, but also respond to individuals who may be um, suffering from depression, where there's a risk of suicide, individuals who have a mental health crisis, uh, and really add on to kind of more of a holistic approach to how we respond to 911 calls that come in. Uh, so with that, I'll turn to, to Brandon to talk specifically about best practice for OPAs. 
Sure. So one of the things we have the benefit of is being a part of the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, which provides us with a lot of guidance as it relates to building an oversight uh, agency for Grand Rapids. One of the things that they um, tell often is that oversight is not cookie cutter. Uh, what works in one city is not necessarily what works in another city. So. There are some best practices. There are 12 core elements of civilian oversight, which we have uh, embedded into OPA strategic plan. And uh, we, we plan to operate based off of those things. But uh, we also recognize that there are certain things that have happened in other places that we should pull from. And there are some other things that we shouldn't. So yes, there are best practices. Yes, there are a lot of cities who are engaged in this work. Uh, and we're excited about building a, a, a practice that really works for Grand Rapidians. Yeah. Brandon, one thing we ran out of time to talk about earlier, one, one uh, thing that we've heard from the community is this desire to have our Civilian Appeals Board have subpoena power. And I know that you and our city attorney's office have been working on that and you spoke about it at our last public safety meeting. Do you just want to give a little a brief update on where we are with that? Uh, it is a recommendation we're taking seriously uh, and, and we're looking at options to build that as a tool in the toolbox for that body. Sure. So uh, I did request a legal opinion from the city attorney's office based off of the uh, recommendations from community related to the, our civilian appeals board having some type of subpoena power or additional investigative authority. Uh, it's important that we point out that our civilian appeals board already has investigative authority. Um, they can direct our labor relations department currently, and maybe that'll be OPA at some point, but they can direct our labor relations division to do additional investigation if they find it necessary in one of the cases that they're seeing. But the subpoena power question, really, um, that question, and, and excuse the background, but that question is really uh, based off of whether or not we can command people to come before the Civilian Appeals Board. So um, currently, police officers or city staff, if, if, if they're asked to appear, appear. Um, so we don't need subpoena power for that. The subpoena power really is about uh, other people, meaning community members being forced to come before this board. And, and one of the things that the city attorney talked about is that there are some other ways to get documents or information that we need through a legal process. And, and some information about that is, is out on our website as well. And we'll talk about that more in the future. But we are definitely looking at all of these different options. We want to make sure that our civilian appeals board and the Office of Oversight and Public Accountability can do our jobs well in order to make sure that there is increased accountability. Thanks, Brandon. You know, Brandon, um, a lot has happened since you've taken this role, even while you're interim. And I just wondered if um, a little bit of uh, how the situations developed around the Memorial Day holiday, how you saw your role during that time, and how that got us from there to here where we are now. What kind of progress, what kind of efforts are going on? There was a lot of a community outcry, um, at least in part having to do with policing, although there were some other influences that were a part of those events. Sure. So uh, that's, that's a little question. Um, <laughs> so the events that occurred occurred soon after I, uh, I mean, within two weeks maybe of me uh, starting officially in this role as Director of Oversight and Public Accountability. And, and we were in our strategic planning process, but there was definitely a huge impact on how we were planning it. And even the, the voice we heard from community before the incidents and after the incidents. And, and whenever I talk about, you know, the, the weekend of May 31st, it's important to me to point out the, ra the rationale or the reason behind the outrage. Uh, and, and, you know, we talk about the murder of George Floyd and, and now of Breonna Taylor and the impact that that has on communities that have to see that and experience that and then deal with the trauma associated with it. Um, I, I often talk about the fact that, you know, I grew up um, in, in a way where I experienced brutality at the hand of the police. Um, I, I can remember very vividly being pulled out of a, a car and thrown up against, uh, out of my car and thrown up against my car because I fit the description of a bank robber when I was, I don't know, 17 years old, driving um, from Bible class, literally coming from Bible class, you know? Um, and it's something that sticks with you forever. So when, when there are incidents, and I don't mean to, to, you know, make my situation seem like it is the same as murder or anything like that, but there are incidents that stick with people for, for years and years, right? And so I saw my role in the situation, 
um, as one who, first of all, understands based on lived experience why there's outrage. And I saw my role as a liaison to communicate that uh, to those, you know, to, to city leaders, to other city leaders, to make sure that we were having conversation from the place of the why and not just from the what. Um, because the what was important to talk about, but the why was as well. Um, and, and I was I was fortunate enough to be able to, to play that role and also to have leaders who um, in many ways understood that already and wanted to be a part of those types of conversations. So that was part of my role. I think the, the next part was to try to look at how we move forward. And one of the phrases we've been talking about is reimagining policing. And, you know, we have a, a new police chief and a, a relatively new city manager and a new director of oversight and public accountability. And we're all in a position where we're reimagining systems that have been around for a long time, well before we were serving in these roles. Um, so, so part of our responsibility now is to look at what has been happening and then say, uh, what I continue to go back to, is it just? Is this the right thing? Should we be doing it that way? Uh, and I think that decision to look at policing in that way is, is going to take us forward as Grand Rapidians to a place uh, where we have the ideal situation for our community. We mentioned, the mayor already mentioned that on August 12th, there's a, an event, an opportunity for community dialogue that has to do with uh, healing from trauma. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that exact event and maybe some of the other events coming. We've got a couple minutes left and would like to hear what we can look forward to. Sure, so we're really excited about our trauma event. It's uh, healing from vicarious or processing vicarious and, and actual trauma. Um, and, and oftentimes we don't recognize that sometimes use of force incidents or uh, having to see people murdered on social media at the hands of, of police or you know experience those that type of violence is traumatic um, and it impacts our mental health and uh, we at the city recognize that you know the office of oversight and public accountability got i'm not a mental health professional um, our director of equity and engagement is not a mental health professional. Fortunately, we have a mayor who actually, you know, does have a lot of experience in, in that, that area and is trained in that way. Um, but we also knew that in order to help heal our community, we needed to do something, even though it was not our, our area of expertise, something had to happen. So we put together a program collaboratively with uh, mental health leaders in the community. Um, and, and we're fortunate that they have volunteered their time to be a part of this to help community members process trauma. So there will be a virtual, you know, in the age of COVID, uh, most things are virtual now. So there will be a, a virtual session where we will be um, asking some questions and just talking about how to process trauma and things of that nature. Um, and so that will be August 12th. It'll be uh, via OPA's Facebook page. So if you go to Facebook and facebook.com backslash oversight GR, you'll be able to find that. Um, it'll also be shared from the city's Facebook page as well as the Office of Equity and Engagement's Facebook page and live on the city's web page. So there's a lot of ways to get to that event, but we're excited about hosting it. And after that point, there's already been some community members who have expressed interest in, in, in taking on that work and helping to continue to process it as we move forward. Okay. Brandon Davis, thank you for joining us. Um, even while you're away, you made it work. Thank you so much for uh, being on City Connection. Brandon Davis is Director of the Office of Oversight and Accountability with the City of Grand Rapids. Again, thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. So appreciate you and your leadership. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back for the last uh, 12 minutes or so of City Connection here on GRTV's Livewire Channel 24. The Rapidian for the community provides an alternative to be the eyes of somebody who's not there. It's more honest, more authentic, and more true. And you do have the freedom to talk about things because they're things that need to be talked about, not because they'll get readers or viewers or clicks. Sometimes it feels intimidating to write a news story or, or to write a story about a, a community issue. What I love about the Rapidian is that they make it really simple and easy. So it's not like you have to meet this deadline by this time. I'll be eating a sandwich in one hand that I'm like typing in the other. I love the freedom to be able to write from wherever. I think it's a really powerful experience when people are able to tell their story and to be heard. Anyone can have a voice. Anybody can speak. It's a platform for the community to tell its own story in a very authentic way and that's powerful. The community has to be involved in order for it to be sustainable. And so it tells you something about our community.
Welcome back to City Connection. Again, our thanks to uh, Director Davis from the Office of Oversight and Accountability here at the City of Grand Rapids. Uh, Mayor, it did occur to me when Mr. Davis was talking that you are a social worker and puts you in a unique uh, place and a unique perspective. And just tell me a little bit how that's kind of played into um, as you watch our community go through not only COVID, but um, trauma from police violence uh, across the country. Yeah. Yeah, it's been, uh, uh, well, for, first off, I, um, I'm grateful to have the experience as a social worker, uh, even, even during the pandemic. Um, so much of my time was spent uh, listening to people. Um, and I, I tried to, once it was safe, I tried to get out in the community and I volunteered quite a bit um, at different locations, handing out food and talking to uh, families and young people who were being impacted. Um, I did a lot of Zoom calls with mm -hmm. um, young people. So I met with my mayor's youth council, um, really talked to them about you know, what they were experiencing, um, as well as other groups. Uh, and so a lot of it was listening and uh, trying to reassure folks that we're in this together and um, we have great resources. A lot of time working with United Way to identify you know, what are the needs out there? Um, do we need to raise more money? How do we do that? Worked with the blood banks, so there were a number of days where we were really short on blood supplies, so getting the word out about that. So I think my connections with so many nonprofit organizations just through my experience in working in the nonprofit world was really helpful. Um, and then, you know, with the, with the racial uh, tensions and unrest and um, the, the real anger and outrage, and I know that Brandon spoke to this, um, you know, people have, people have really good reasons to be angry and outraged and being okay to sit with that. So even after the, um, the protests and the violence on May 31st, that, that next week, I, uh, I had a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations, but a lot, a lot of um, smaller group conversations where I mostly sat and listened. Uh, mm -hmm. And I listened to a lot of anger and outrage and pain and tears. Uh, and I do believe that my, my background in social work really helped me to sit and be present with that. Uh, but then on the flip side, uh, trying to figure out, okay, how do we move forward? Like, how do we use this moment as an opportunity for real change, but also how do we do it in a thoughtful way that truly has a positive impact, right? That how do we do it in a deliberative way where we truly are going to get to the outcomes that we so desperately want to see? Uh, and that's outcomes that are not racialized, right? We don't want to see these disparate outcomes that we continue to see in our community, whether it's around housing or employment or education or corrections or arrest rates or traffic stops or policing. So how do we really look at it even beyond policing to look at all of these different systems and what do we need to do right now to drive forward some of the change that we've been talking about? And how do we do that in the midst of a pandemic? And how do we figure out how to, how to fund it? Uh, you know, a big conversation has been around police funding. And uh, you know, as I said earlier, we sh did shift about $400,000 from the police department. We're looking at you know, adding behavioral mental health, you know, and we'll, we'll look at funding within the police department to do that. Um, there was a call for an immediate $9 million cut to the police department. Uh, and our city manager was like, okay, let's, take a deep breath here, there's a process in place for budget changes, and let's not, make, let's not do something that potentially could have real unintended consequences. Um, and you know, so for me, we have a lot of good work happening right now. The police department, Chief Payne is gonna be before the full commission on August 11th, presenting the strategic plan and what he wants to do within the department to create change. I believe we need to give him the opportunity to do that. We need to figure out where do we want to go, what outcomes we want to see, how much is that going to cost, and how do we fund it? Uh, so to me, I, I think those two conversations are intertwined. Um, and then, and then uh, like I'll give you an example of unintended consequences. So for the last four years, we have worked really hard to diversify our, our police department. And even when Chief Payne came and joined us on this show, he talked about our recruit class and grow your own and some of the intentional outreach we're doing. And our last 
recruit classes over the last three years have been the most diverse recruits we've ever hired within the police department, both with gender and with race. And if we did have to immediately cut the department and if the department laid people off, the first people that would be laid off are the newest hires because that's how contracts work. So it's based on seniority. Uh, the last thing I want to do is lay off uh, you know, some of our most diverse uh, police officers who are really the future of the department. Um, so anyway, we just got to think through thoughtfully, uh, you know, where do we want to go? How do we get there? But make sure that we're doing it in a way that's good for the community where we still have, you know, a public safety department that can respond to 911 calls that require a police officer to show up quickly, uh, as well as how do we work through reform that truly reimagines and um, really restructures what policing looks like in this city. And that's complex work. And it doesn't happen overnight, even though it's super urgent. We're working on it. Uh, uh, I, I mean, so many city staff um, and community members in partnership with the city are working on this. Uh, and I believe, I really believe we're going to see some significant change. A couple of the demands you've mentioned have been addressed, at least in terms of talking a little bit about uh, redirecting funding, yeah. um, a little bit about this new Office of Oversight and Accountability uh, that kind of maybe gets to the heart of brutality issues that have really mm -hmm. kind of um, driven some of these calls. What are some next steps the city is looking at? You talked a little bit about the chief coming before the commission on the 11th, I believe it was. Yeah. Um, what are some next steps? Yeah, so next steps and process-wise, so it will be um, actually the, the Office of uh, Oversight. So Mr. Davis will also come forward once he gets community feedback about his strategic plan that will be finalized. And then he'll start implementing a number of things laid out in that um, plan. The police chief will come forward with, plan, with the department's plan. He'll provide similarly um, several weeks for the community to weigh in and get feedback on that plan before it's finalized. Um, and in the meantime, we're working on policy changes. So even right now, and I'm hopeful that by the 11th, um, all of the policy changes that we've talked about will be in place. So we're currently um, updating our use of force policy to you know, ban chokeholds, uh, require de-escalation, a duty to intervene. Uh, so all of that is currently being worked on in partnership with our, uh, our city attorney's office. So that hopefully those policies will be changed soon. Um, in addition, we're working on adding the uh, behavioral health and mental health specialists to our homeless outreach team. We're also looking at some violence prevention efforts um, with community. We've seen a pretty significant increase in gun violence um, and homicides this year. And uh, so we're hopeful that we'll be able to move forward with an evidence-based violence prevention program yet this year uh, and get that off the ground. Again, likely in partnership with community uh, members and organizations, um, but we're hoping to, to flesh out those details soon. Okay. Well, I've got one question from a Facebook uh, watcher of the show that maybe you take with you and you come back with some information. We All had right. this come up a little bit when we had Chief Payne on the show, but this has to actually do with some motor vehicle issues. And it says, I live on the corner, this comes from Vicki, I live on the corner of Lake Michigan Drive and Lane. There's an accident there again last night around 11 p.m. A car hit a pickup and it took police 30 to 45 minutes to show up after that original call. So really concerns about that intersection, about um, yeah. vehicles uh, going through the intersection without stopping. And I do recall this coming up when Chief Payne was here, but just maybe if we can get an update on the next show, a little bit about um, what yeah. Police, Police Chief Payne can tell us about that intersection and, and whether there can be extra um, uh, enforcement or surveillance. Yeah, I'll follow up because I thought after the last show I'd sent that to my traffic safety department and they analyze uh, crash rates at intersections and then they'll go and do an analysis to see if the anything has to change with traffic signals or things like that. Enforcement is one piece, but sometimes as uh, intersections become busier, sometimes you have to upgrade them and, and make some changes. So I will, I will follow up on that. Uh, we have seen, it's interesting, we saw uh, obviously a lull during uh, you know, March, April, May. Mm -hmm with traffic accidents because right. so many people weren't right. driving. Uh, but I would say probably early July, we started to see as people started to get out more uh, and get back to work, we've seen an, an uptick. So I'll, I'll look into that. Uh, okay. 
with one more minute to go and two more questions rolling in, I think we can revisit some of this next month, but um, just for uh, putting the questions out there and we'll come back to this. When is it legally determined that there has been wrongdoing by a member of the city's police force and the court has awarded the victim damages, where does the money come from? So that's a question mm -hmm. for next month. And then another one is, uh, this comes from Hugo, and so he says, I challenge the mayor to come out and look out my window any night of the week and see 40 people selling drugs and urinating without masks. So, oh. so Does it say where, where um, that's and located? May, it does not, but maybe we can follow up with that okay. one. I believe that one comes through Facebook as well. Okay. So maybe we can get some more information for next month. About next month, uh, the first Monday of the month would be the Labor Day holiday, so we're going to move to one week later, and we have, um, timely enough, we have City Manager Mark Washington okay. joining us next month. So we'll be back with City Connection with a little bit more on this subject at the very okay. least, a little bit broader. Mary, any final words as we head out, as you um, talk about odd times? Yeah, you know, I, I encourage people to stay engaged. I mean, in addition to the work we're doing uh, to get through the pandemic and around policing and police reform, we're also working on a whole host of other issues around housing, affordable housing. I'm extremely concerned about families who are not going to have access to the additional unemployment. So if you are struggling with paying your rent or mortgage, please contact United Way. Um, the city and the county have been talking at length about what we can do around eviction prevention, mortgage foreclosure prevention. The state of Michigan allocated $60 million for eviction prevention. So please reach out if you need, if you need help, if, if you need help with utilities. We've been working really closely with our partners at our utilities for some um, grant funding and to help families. And then there's a map that is available if you need help with food. Uh, so you can find out where is a place close to you where you can go and get um, support to make sure that you have food to eat. Perfect. All right, Mayor Roslyn Bliss, yeah. thank you again for uh, another episode of City Connection with yeah. lots of great information. Thanks. We'll be back in about a month and a week on uh, the 14th of September. This is City Connection and I'm Linda Galash with Grand Rapids Community Media Center. Thanks.